family farm is a family effort. And if you're so blessed to have kids that are willing to help you on the farm, or spouses that are willing to get involved in your passion to help you keep your love of agriculture going, that's um, a wonderful thing. And um, so here, the 20th year, Ron's done the trade show, pulled all these speakers together. Now I'm gonna have the pleasure to introduce one of the speakers who, um, and I hope he doesn't mind, was just uh, thinking out of the box a little bit in agriculture. And this year, our trade show um, theme, and I, um, I came up with it myself, so I ought to know what it is, but it's succeed on your place with out of the box farming. And so it's trying to find a way to make a living on the farm and staying with living out in the country, which we love, staying with a connection to the land, which we happen to love, and livestock and um, plants. We do um, some gardening. Um, and I'm going into um, John Eichard's introduction. He is our keynote speaker, and John has been connected with the University of Missouri. He's a um, professor emeritus now, and he started years ago doing kind of out-of-the-box thinking for agriculture, and it wasn't just corn, wheat, and beans that he was thinking of, but it was more of some of these other concepts. John has been a tremendous contributor to Ron's magazine, and over the years has um, had a department in the magazine where he's continually written one article after another article and enlightened people in a way that for sure I wouldn't have the intellect expertise to be able to contribute, but his de depth of knowledge of agriculture in the traditional sense, as well in um, new way of thinking about agriculture is tremendous. We're fortunate to have him here and thank him so much for coming down from um, Iowa to be with us. John has written several books, Sustainable Capitalism, Return to Common Sense, Small Farms or Real Farms, Crisis in Opportunity, sustainability in American agriculture, a revolution in the middle, and his latest book is Economic Stability. So John approaches things from uh, higher intellect that I could ever do and uh, really helps connect that type of thinking with what uh, people might be doing on their farm and how to approach it. And I want to thank you again so much for coming to our trade show this year, and welcome John Eichard. Thanks, John. I, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be back here. If I recall right, Ron, I spoke at the first conference 20 years ago out at the Expo Center. Um, that's a long time ago. I was trying to think back at what I might have talked about at that conference. I didn't, most of the time nowadays I write a paper, I can go back and look, but Back then, uh, I had just come back to the University of Missouri after being gone from Missouri for 20 years. I came back in late 89. And uh, I think probably what I talked about, because I was talking about it at that time, was the definition of sustainable agriculture. You know, here 20 years later, we're still <laughs> arguing about the definition of sustainable agriculture. But I suspect I said something to the effect that a sustainable agriculture is an agriculture that's capable of maintaining its productivity and its usefulness to society indefinitely, forever. That's what sustainability is about. It's about permanence. When I talk about it now in terms of the issues of sustainability, I talk more in terms of sustainability as meeting the needs of the present without diminishing opportunities for the future. And I think that's, that's really what it means. It means meeting the basic needs of all people, not everything that everybody much want, might want, but the basic needs of everybody today, but doing it in such a way that it doesn't diminish the opportunities of those people of future generations to meet their needs as well. And I think that applies to agriculture, and I think it applies across the board. 
Now, like many of us had hoped, the sustainable agriculture as a movement has not become the dominant kind of paradigm or the dominant model of agriculture. We're still in the midst of, a, of an industrial agriculture that continues to, to move in different forms. And we're corporatization of agriculture, as I call it today, on top of industrialization. But unlike a, a lot of people had thought, sustainable agriculture wasn't just a passing fad. It wasn't just one of these flash in a pan that's going to be here for a few years and then nobody will remember what it is. It's still there. And the issue of sustainability grows stronger every year. In fact, if you go on the internet for any major corporation or any major organization, you'll find that they all have sustainability initiatives of one kind or another. Many of those won't fit my definition of sustainability because where we are now, we're in the process of where the largest corporations, the industrial corporations, have come to the realization that they can no longer ignore the rising questions of sustainability because the public opinion is forcing them to address this issue in one way or another. And what they're trying to do now is what we would call co-opt or redefine sustainability so that they can pretend to create a sustainable operation without really changing anything much from what they've been doing in the past. But I think the sustainability question is the defining question of the 20th century or the 21st century and eventually they'll have to address authentic sustainability. When I was thinking about what I might talk about here 20 years later, you know, I went back over the years. I've, I've spoken at this conference many times, not every year, but probably more than half of them, maybe three courses, fourths of the year. So trying to come up with something different, something new. Instead of doing that, I, I think what I'm going to deal with are some of the, the big questions, the big issues, the fundamental principles, the fundamental process, concepts of sustainability that permeate sustainable agriculture, economic sustainability, social sustainability, ecological sustainability. And I'm going to leave it mainly up to you to figure out how that fits on your particular farming operation. So if you're here interested in how to make compost or the best breeds for free range chickens, then you need to go somewhere else because that's not what I'm going to talk about. Those things are critically important. And I, but I think that's individual information that you have to determine for your particular farm. What I'm going to talk about are, are the big questions, and I tell students and anyone else that the, you know, the fundamental purpose of all education, not just formal education, but our education uh, as adults, seeking information on the internet or reading books or whatever, the, the fundamental purpose of education is to try to gain a better understanding of how the world works and where we fit within it so we can decide individually how we want to live our life day by day. And that's the big questions that I'm going to talk about today. And when I, I speak, I say many times, and I'll say it again today, that, that what I say is my truth. I speak my truth with conviction because I know why I believe what I believe. But if your truth is different from mine, that's all right with me because I don't think any of us should be so egotistical as to think that only we know the truth. I think we're all looking for the truth. My truth is, is that we're in the process of recreating the food system because our current food system quite simply is not sustainable from the retail level, the process level, down to the farm level. The dominant food system today is not sustainable. That's my truth. And what I think it means is that that creates new opportunities as we recreate the food system. There's opportunities for small farmers, medium-sized farmers, other people that simply did not exist in the past. And what I want to do is try to give you a concept of this big picture and the big changes, and then you decide how your farm fits in it and how you want to live your life day by day. Let me start with the broadest scale. The current financial crisis, the global financial crisis. You know, they say the recession is over, but you and I both know that it's not. Maybe it's over for a few people at the top end because the stock market continues to grow, but for the rest of the people, it's not over. I think the financial crisis that began in, in 2008 and lingers hit still today has raised serious questions among people all around the world 
about the strength and stability of the global economic system. But I think that the crisis may in fact turn out to be a blessing in disguise because I think it may finally drive home to many people that we have created an unsustainable economy, an unsustainable global economy, but an unsustainable economy in this country as well. As I said before, a sustainable economy would be an economy that's capable of meeting the needs of people today without diminishing opportunities for those of the future. And when we ask the questions of sustainability seriously about today's economy, we come to the realization that our economic system today is not meeting the needs of many people today, even in the United States, but certainly around the globe, and we are not leaving equal or better opportunities for those of future generations because we are destroying the natural resource base and the human resource base upon which agriculture, all productivity, agriculture and economic productivity in general come from. Now we've been told over the years, we said we can't really address these environmental issues that we've known are there, the conservation issues, or we can't really address the social equity issues because it would get in the way of economic growth. So we rolled back much of the environmental registration. We basically forgot about social equity in the country. And as a consequence, we find that the economy quit growing anyway. The basic problem was, is we failed to realize that all economic value comes from nature by way of society. There's no place else to get anything of economic value. There's no place else to get anything of any use to us. It all comes from, from the soil, from the air, from the water, from the energy. It all comes from the earth. And if we move beyond self-sufficiency, in other words, feeding ourselves from the earth, then we have to depend upon society. When we start to trade and when we create markets, then we have to depend upon the integrity of society. And what we're seeing today are the consequences of degrading the productivity of nature and degrading the productivity of society to the point where we can no longer sustain the economic growth that we've become accustomed to in the past. The same thing is true of agriculture. We've created a, an unsustainable agriculture. We've destroyed or degraded the natural productivity of the soil. We've become reliant on the fossil energy inputs of the fertilizers and the pesticides. And now we see that those supplies are, are going to be running short and increasingly expensive as we go into the future. We've forced the families off the farm. We've destroyed the rural communities and we've destroyed the capacity and the, the will of the people to farm the land in a way that maintains the health of the land and the health of the people. And we're seeing the consequences today of an agriculture that may appear to be prosperous, prosperous, but it's propped up by government programs that if those government programs like the biofuel programs was pulled out, American agriculture would drop like a rock. We've got to return to the basic ideas that all productivity, all economic value comes from the earth, it comes from the land, it comes from people, and the only way to have a sustainable agriculture is to regenerate the productivity of the land and restore the productivity of people in rural communities and people on family farms. When the fossil inputs are gone or become increasingly expensive, that's where we have to get back to. Now, when the economists, most of the economists will say, well, all we really need to do to fix the economy, including agriculture, is to get the prices right. They, they recognize that, that the pursuit of economic interest, the way we're doing it today, particularly the industrial economy, degrades the land. It pollutes the soil. It, 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 it degrades the productivity. You end up with erosion and various other things that degrade the productivity, the natural productivity of the land. And they understand that there's negative social impacts of the things that we do in a pursuit of economic self-interest. But they say, if you would simply put a dollar and cent price on the damage that we do to nature, a dollar and cent price on the damage that we do to society, then the markets would be perfectly capable of allocating our resources so that we would have long-run sustainability. But we have to do more than getting the prices right. Simply internalizing the externalities ignores the fact that there are social values that have no dollar and cent price. They are fundamentally different from economic values and they're ecological values that have no dollar and cent price. We have to do more than get the prices right. It's this blind faith in markets 
That's not the, that's not the solution to the problem, is to run everything through the markets. That, that is the basic source of the problem, not the solution. If we're going to achieve uh, sustainability within our economy, society, within agriculture, we have to fundamentally change our way of thinking. Albert Einstein said one day that you can't solve a problem using the same thinking you were using when you created it. And that's what we're trying to do when we simply try to run everything through the markets and tinker around with the existing system. We're going to have to fundamentally change our concept of how the world works and where we fit within it. You see, the economic worldview is that there's a little part of society that's impacted by, by the economy, and there's a little part of nature that's impacted by the economy, and if we just tinker with those little parts, then everything will be all right. But I would argue my truth, my reality, I think it makes common sense, is, is that the whole of society is contained within nature. We, we are another species. Human is another species among many species that populate this earth. It's not a small overlap between society and, and nature. We're a part of that natural ecosystem. We're a part of that living system, and we're integrally related with all of those living and non-living elements within, within that system. And the economy is a creation of society, and the whole of the economy is contained within society. So everything that we do in terms of pursuing our economic self-interest has an impact on society and has an impact on nature because the whole of the economy is contained within. It's not a matter of these overlapping pieces. We're a part of the whole and the economy is a part within. And I think the important part is, is that we need to recognize that within these, in these hierarchies, being a part of nature, we're, we're subject to the basic principles, the basic laws of nature and our economy has to be subjected to the basic laws or the basic principles by which healthy societies must function. I, I think probably this idea is, is much more clear in agriculture than it is about any place else because if you think about it in agriculture, you realize that the whole of that farm is dependent upon the earth, it's dependent upon the land, and all of the life comes from the land, and all of the value comes from the land. And getting the things that have economic value from that land depend upon the people, the farmers that farm that land, land that, that, that nurture the, the living things within the soil and the living things above the soil. And so all economic value then arises from the land by way of people. That's the, that's, it, it's the same as true everywhere. It's just more obvious when we look at it in agriculture. And we realize, too, that that agriculture is the basic source of all human life. We're biological beings. We can't eat the electricity that we gather by windmills or waterfalls or something of that nature. We're dependent upon this living system. We're a part of this living system. We're interconnected with that. We're no less dependent upon on the, on the land and the life that comes from the land today than we were when we were a, 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 a species of hunters and gatherers or subsistence farmers. The, Connections are less, less direct and more complex, but they're still there. The important thing about this hierarchy, as I said, is that the purpose is defined at a higher level. If we think about the, the purpose of society is defined as humans within, within nature, you may say, well, I, I don't think there's any purpose for human life, and that, that's okay if that's your truth, but I don't think life makes any sense. Unless there's some purpose for us being here, what difference does it make what we do if there's nothing in particular we're supposed to do? Why, why, why should we get up in the morning, you know, if there's nothing in particular we need to do today, but then why not, you know? So like, none of it just makes any sense. But that purpose is a part of something bigger than us. And so our purpose as people is derived as being a part of nature, and the, the purpose of the economy then is to serve specific needs of people within society. But the lower levels are also important because the potentials or possibilities of the lower le higher levels are determined by the lower levels. In other words, we have to be able to meet our needs, economic needs as individuals if we're to contribute to the greater good of society. And then the, the society then can either impact positively or negatively upon nature. There was many decades, centuries, whenever humans were not powerful enough to do any damage to nature, but I think those days are long past, so nature is also dependent upon us. So we have to bring all of this together. The same thing is true in the agricultural economy. 
the purpose of the agricultural economy comes from the broader society and the purpose is we as individuals, as farmers, comes from the higher level. We can have this hierarchy of, of sustainability, as I call it. The, we, we can ignore this basic hierarchy, but we can't avoid the consequences of it. You see, there's fundamental principles that are determined as basic functioning of nature, and we're not quite sure what those are, but we can't redefine them. We can only discover them, and we can ignore them, for example. We can deny the, the law of gravity, and we can say, I don't believe in the law of gravity. But I tell you, even if you don't believe in gravity, if you drop something heavy on your foot, it's still going to hurt. And it's the same way with any of the other principles. If you look at basic principles of nature, of natural healthy ecosystems, they're holistic. Everything is interconnected. The whole is something more than the sum of its parts. The relationships among the pieces matter. I mean, if we're only dealing with pieces of things without looking at the whole, then we're going to realize the inevitable negative consequences of our failure to respect the principle of holism. Healthy natural ecosystems are diverse. You have to have a diversity of things that fit together, that relate to each other. And if you ignore the principle of diversity on your farm, eventually you're going to realize the consequences. A third principle of, of natural ecosystems is interdependence. The relationships among those diverse parts within the whole to be healthy have to be mutually beneficial, not destructive, not exploitive, but each benefiting the other. These are fundamental principles of nature, and we're a part of nature. Our society, our economy is a part of nature, which means those apply at all levels. I would argue there's fundamental social principles that are just as important as those physical principles that I've talked about. If you want to have positive relationships with other people, there's, you know, we may disagree on a lot of different values, but there's certain things I think we agree on, that you have to be honest and fair and responsible and respectful and compassionate. And if you violate those principles, you're going to degrade your relationships. If you put honesty and fairness, responsibility together, you have relationships of trust and trustworthiness. And if you fulfill or uh, uh, prove to be trustworthy, then the relationships grow stronger. If you violate a trust, they grow weaker. These are fundamental principles, fundamental laws. Principle of kindness or caring. We all make mistakes. We need to be forgiven. You can't sustain positive human relationships without kindness, forgiveness, and compassion that comes with it. We have to have the courage to be kind and to be compassionate and to be trusting and trustworthy in a world that considers those things naive and idealistic. There are fundamental principles of economics. The economists didn't make these things up. There are characteristics as individual meeting our individual interests, that, such as scarcity. Economic value depends upon scarcity, not necessity. You only pay for things that there's not enough of to go around. Economic efficiency, you getting the most that we can out of whatever we have to work with applies across the board. It's a fundamental principle. Sovereignty. The ability to make our own choices, make our own decisions, everything else depends upon that. These are fundamental principles of how the world works. And if we're to be successful in our life and to achieve whatever our purpose is, we have to learn to respect those things. And I think that's not what we're doing today with sustainability. We're still tinkering around the edges. As I talked about here at the conference last year, everything doesn't eventually boil down to a matter of economics, regardless of what the economists say. Social values and ethical values are fundamentally different than economic values. Economic values are individual. They recruit to the individual. An aggregate economy is just a collection of individual enterprises. The relationships don't really matter. Economic value is instrumental. It's always a means to an end. There's an expectation you're going to get something back of greater value whenever you give something away or trade something away. Economic values are impersonal. The person doesn't matter. For something to have economic value, you have to be able to trade it. You have to be able to buy it and sell it. If it's related to a specific individual, you can't trade it away. You can't buy it and sell it. It has no economic value if the particular person involves matters. And that brings us to social values and the basic differences. Social value is interpersonal. It occurs between two people or within a group of people that know each other, that are connected to each other. Social values are instrumental, our relationships are instrumental. There's an expectation of getting something out of it, but it's not precise at what you get or when you get it. But if you want to have a friend, you've got to be a friend. 
It's reciprocity. There's something involved. But the difference is social value is inherently personal. It applies to a particular person. It's connected to that person. It can't be traded. It can't be bought or sold. You know, you can't trade your friend. You've got a friendship. You can't trade your friend to someone else. You can't trade that friendship. You can quit being a friend with one person and start with another. But the friendship you have is unique between the person. You can't trade your spouse. You can get a divorce and get remarried, but you can't trade the relationship with one spouse to somebody else. So it has no economic value. These things that we know are critically important to our quality of life have absolutely no economic value. An important thing about social value, it evolves into ethical values. As we relate to people in a personal way, we learn that what's right and good in our relationship with people that we know is also right and good with people that we don't know. And we should treat everybody as we treat our friends and we treat our neighbors. And that's when social values evolve into, into cultural values or ethical values. And the important part of that is that, that, that ethical values are, are not individual or impersonal. E ethical values are communal. They apply to everybody everywhere, society as a whole. They're not instrumental, which is critically important. You don't do it because the expectation of getting something back in return, you do it because it's the right and good thing to do. It's non-instrumental. It's, it's communal. And that's the important part when we talk about sustainability because you have no economic value in doing anything for someone of future generations in addition to doing anything for society as a whole. There's no social value in doing something for those of future generations. You won't know anybody there. You won't be there. You only do it if you feel an ethical or moral responsibility for the future of humanity and, and the well-being of society as a whole. This is a reality. This is a truth that the corporations will never face. Because you see, a, a large corporation has no capacity for social relationships or social value because it's not really a human regardless of what the Supreme Court says. It's only a collection of people that are pursuing their economic interests. The only common value the shareholders of these large multinational corporations have, the only common value that they have being many nationalities in many different countries is the desire to increase their wealth. They will never value social relationships. They will never value ethical relationships. We have to have real people making decisions for sustainability. Now, of course, there's some social value, there's some economic value in doing things that are socially responsible because there's a lot of people, you know, people, or economists call about reducing transactions costs. It's easier to deal with people that you trust and things of that nature. And there's economic value in doing things that are ethical, you know, green marketing, things like that. People value those things. But ultimately, we have to realize that there are important social and ethical values that have no economic values. And we have to make decisions based on our social and ethical values. Where we're talking about farming, what I think we're talking about, what is family farming was always about. It was a way of life. It wasn't just a business. It wasn't just the economics. It was the social. It was the family. It was the neighbors. And it was stewardship. It was taking care of the land. It was the ethic of farming. That's the kind of farming that we'll have to have again if it's going to be sustainable. You know, when we make decisions, we not only have to get the principles right, but we have to get the priorities right as well. Because the, the basic ethical values that I'm talking about are the overarching values of of the principles, our interpretation of the principles of how the world works and where we fit. That's where we start from. Within that, we can have societies that have different social values and this sort of thing, as long as it doesn't violate the fundamental principles of nature, the fundamental so ethical values on which societies have to be based. And then the economy has to function within the bounds of society, as a part of society, in accordance with the basic principles of nature and the values of the society within which is created. And the economy is important to meet our individual, instrumental, impersonal needs, but that's not everything. The priorities have to be the ethical, the social, and the economic. What we've done is we've turned it upside down. We give the highest priority to the economic. In this presidential campaign, what, what are you hearing? It's about the economy. It's about jobs. You know, that, that's just one reflection of this overall thing. We will do things that are, that are right for our neighbors and right for societies as long as it doesn't get in the way of economic growth. The economy takes priority. 
We will do things that we know are ethically and morally right as long as it doesn't compromise our social status or get in the way of economic growth. We have to get our priorities right. We have to put the fundamental principles, the basic ethical moral principles of how nature works and where we fit at the highest and then we social value and then the economy to function sustainably must function within the bounds. There's a basic function that society has to fill in a sustainable economy and we have to fill it through the processes of government. A lot of people want to do away with government today. Well, I agree government isn't working, but we have to make it work. We have to realize that we have to come together as people within our communities, and once we get beyond the bounds of friendship and family, we have to function at the local, regional, national level in some means to constrain the economic exploitation of the natural and human resources if we're to create a sustainable economy. And I'm not defending government the way it is, but I'm saying we have to come together as a people and establish the social and ethical bounds within which our economy must function or it's not going to function sustainably. We see the same things I'm talking about here within our food system as well. We see all of the things that I've talked about. We have, we have focused our farming system, our total food system, on the, on the single criteria of greater productivity and greater efficiency. We have, we have put profitability, we have put the pursuit of profits on the farm, pursuit of economic well-being, ahead of the people of rural communities, ahead of family farms, and we put it ahead of the stewardship of the land and the protection of the land and the conservation of the natural fertility of the land for the benefit of future generations. And we're seeing the consequences now of having that priority upside down. And if we're going to farm sustainably, we've got to get our priorities right on the farm. We've got to go back and realize that, that all productivity eventually arises from the land. It arises from the soil and the water and the air. And if we're going to have a sustainable agriculture, we have to sustain the productivity and the integrity of the natural resource system. And we have to focus again on maintaining the integrity of the human resource system, the farmers, the farmers on the land, the communities within which those farmers function. And we have to value those ethical and social principles if we're going to sustain the economic viability of agriculture as well. We have to realign the priorities. But first, I think we have to start with all of these things is we have to start at a deeper level and go back and rethink and redefine what we think is the fundamental purpose of us being here on Earth. What's the basic purpose of our life? Is it, is it to get wealthy, to have income, to get rich? You know, people throughout human history, the ancient philosophers, religions and of all kinds, have, have realized up until fairly recently that the economy or the economics was, was just a means to an end. It, it wasn't an end in itself to get wealthy or to make money. That was so we could do things that made us happy. And there was the realization that, that certainly that we are material beings, that we need food, clothing, shelter. We need those things that are necessary for our physical life. But that we're also social beings, that we need to relate to other people in positive ways. We need to... We need to care for others and we need to be cared for. We need to love and we need to be loved. And it's a basic human need. And wh whenever we sacrifice the quality of those social relationships in our pursuit of greater economic wealth or income, we don't enhance our quality of life or our happiness. We diminish it. And we're also ethical and moral beings. We, we need to believe that our, our life is significant, that it matters, that we amount to something, that there's some purpose that we're pursuing. That's what lets us define what we think is right and what's wrong for us, and we need that. And whenever we compromise our ethics or morality in the pursuit of either social prestige or economic well-being, we don't improve our quality of life, we diminish it. People throughout human history have realized that, 
that what life is about is the pursuit of happiness, the pursuit of overall well-being, not just the pursuit of wealth. Economic individual well-being is, is one dimension of that, but the social dimension and the ethical dimension are just as important. And a life of happiness is a life of balance and harmony among the hierarchies of nature, among the hierarchies of intentionality that I've talked about before. This is where we need to return to if we're going to achieve a sustainable society. And it's totally in tune with what we need to do. The principles of, of happiness are totally in tune with where the principles of sustainability. And I would argue that as we address these issues of sustainability, and as we redefine what it means a, life, a, 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 a purposeful life is about or a life of happiness is about, it's going to create new opportunities for farmers. And now I'm getting back to the farm because I think we see this already. I think this is what has driven the organic food movement. This is what is driving the local food movement. An increasing number of people are coming back and saying it's not just about the cheapest, most convenient, quickest food that I can get. I, I want food that has ecological, social, and economic integrity. They're looking for something fundamentally different that fits their values as whole people not just economic beings, but social beings and ethical beings as well. The things where we see this evolving, not just in the organic and local food movement, but you see it most, most clearly when you go to the farmer's market. You're seeing people there because they're not just there to get cheap food, they're there to connect with people. They want to connect with the farmer. They want to know where their food comes from. They want to look someone in the eye that's been out here growing the food and make some judgment. Is this a person of integrity? And talk to that person and say, is this person taking care of the land? Does this person care about community? And they're willing to pay a higher price for the products if they trust the person, if they believe that they're dealing with a person of integrity. It gives them a way to, to connect, and people are looking for opportunities to reconnect with other people because this competitive society that, or economy that we've created in the pursuit of our economic well-being has destroyed that sense of connectedness. We've become a splintered society, and they want to reconnect. People reconnect through CSAs, through Community Supported Agriculture, where they support a particular farmer and pay for a share for the whole year. It's a way to get closer to the land. You see, there's a realization within us somewhere that we're connected to that earth. And we've destroyed that sense of connectedness. That's the reason people like to be out in nature. That's the reason we like to have natural parks and walk along streams. But that's the reason people are buying from from people that they know, they want to get reconnected to the land, they want to go out to the farm, they want to see what's going on out here. I'm saying that these things that, that we look at and say, well, we're just tinkering around the edges of the food system, we're creating a, a philosophically different food system. It's driven by a whole new set of values that haven't been there before. Our relationship, or our dependence upon the land is, is still as, as critical as it's ever been. It's just become so disconnected and some people are looking for ways to reconnect. Sustainable farmers, true sustainable farmers, whether they call themselves organic or biodynamic or holistic or natural or whatever they are, true sustainable farmers have, have always recognized these basic principles that I've talked about. They know that a farm is not a collection of enterprises. It's a whole, it's a living system. They're interconnected with that system. The farmer is a part of that living organization that's out there functioning on the farm. They realize the importance of the principle of diversity, that you have to have these different pieces that all fit together. And they realize the relationships have to be mutually beneficial, interdependent relations. These are fundamental principles of nature that you see reflected on these farms. They recognize also that, that if you're going to create a, a local food system, if you're going to have a CSA or build your customers at the farmer's market, you have to build relationships of trust. The social principle that I've talked about. You have to be trustworthy with your customers and they, they learn the trust. And when, if you ever violate that trust, you're going to destroy the relationship and you're going to destroy the customer. It has to be based on kindness. We all make mistakes. There's times when you're in a CSA, for example, that the crop doesn't turn out the way you expected it to and you have to have, to have some forgiveness at times. And a basic principle is there and you have to have the courage to step out of the mainstream 
and do something fundamentally different than your neighbors are doing than is coming in the overall food system. These are the fundamental principles that I've talked about that the sustainability of the local food system depends upon. And the farmers within the local food system know that they're supporting the local economy. The principle of scarcity, you have to produce something that people value, that's something that people will pay for if you expect to make an economic living. You have to be efficient. You have to use what resources you have, your time, your energy, your land, in a way to produce something that has economic value. And you have to maintain your ability, your sovereignty to make the choices and to accept responsibility for the choices that you make. The most practical things that you do on a farm are linked back to these most general principles of how the world works and define our relationship within it. The local food economy that we talk about today cannot be sustained solely by economic value. If, if you simply want to go out and create the most efficient, most productive food system from the standpoint of pure economics, you end up right where we are today. That's how we got here, focusing on bottom line economics. You'll end up exploiting the land, exploiting your neighbors, destroying rural communities, destroying the integrity of the earth in the pursuit of short-run economic well-being. If we want a sustainable food system, it has to be fundamentally different from that. Certainly, the food has to be affordable. The customer has to be able to buy it. But the sustain is going to be sustained in the local food system by shared social and ethical values. I talked last year about vertical cooperation. I still think that's important. I'm not going to dwell on it, but we've got to move away from competition. We've had a vertically coordinated system in the past that was coordinated by competition, competitive markets. Where we are today, we have a vertically integrated food system that's dominated by large corporations. If we're going to break away from that, if we're going to make what we see in the local and organic and sustainable food movement the food system of the future, it has to be based on vertical cooperation, which means that we bring the customer, the end consumer, and the producer, and the processors and retailers all in the system together. And we don't allow you know, the strongest within that system to take all of the profits or all of the benefits. We come together and decide together what's going to be produced, how it's going to be produced, what the ethical and moral values are that underlies that, which means it's going to be relatively small groups of people and smaller farmers that are involved in it. And we decide together what's fair and what's right, responsible and what's reasonable within that overall system. I think we're going to have to totally rethink this whole thing. We're going to have to go back to the issues of sustainability, and we're going to have to get our, our principles right, our priorities right. And if we do that, we can align the hierarchy of sustainability with the hierarchy of intentionality and create a sustainable food system. If we go from the kind of conceptual that I've talked about here down to the, the really practical, uh, you know, people are always asking me, well, what can I do to move toward a more sustainable lifestyle? And my answer had been in the past for a long time, I said, you know, we need to realize that everybody lives in a watershed. And one time, nobody, nobody really knew much about what watersheds are, but I think almost everybody realizes now, you know, you live in a watershed. And everything that happens in that land that's higher than you are, where you are, eventually affects you. Because whatever's put in the water higher in the watershed eventually is going to come down to your level in the watershed. And so you have a responsibility and a stake in protecting your watershed. Well, more recently, I've come around to the point of view and say, okay, let's, let's talk about everybody lives in a food shed. Now, what's a food shed? A food shed is the area within which your food comes from or the food for a given community comes from. And you know what our food shed is today for most people? It's the whole world. We live in a global food shed because you go down to the grocery store and you've got stuff coming in from all over the world. Do you realize what the consequences are of that global food shed, of continuing to live in that global food shed? It's all of the negative things that I've talked about. That's, that's what created this global food shed, this, this search for the cheapest place in the world to produce the stuff that we can bring in here and put in your supermarket. And, and unless we work at changing our food shed, unless we're willing to change our food shed, and, and to put ethical and social principles ahead of just getting the cheapest stuff in the world, we're not going to create a sustainable food system or a sustainable agriculture. So I say, 
Let's get to work in our food sheds. That's something that everybody can do. You can join a CSA. You can go to the farmer's market. You can, you can plant a garden in your backyard and start raising some of this stuff yourself. You can interrelate with people within your community, and you can help begin to put together local food systems. You can talk to other farmers or talk to your customers or someone else about creating a cooperative relationship, a cooperative organization that's not just based on economic values, but it's based on shared social and ethical values. This is something you can do to create a food shed. I think we have, you can, there's all kinds of things that we can do, and, and we can start within our local communities by doing those things that make sense to us. And finally, it goes back to this basic idea. Again, I have people ask me all the time, well, what, what is the single most important thing to do, or what is it that I should do? It goes back to the idea that I've come to the realization or come to the conclusion, my truth in my old age, that we each have a purpose in life. I don't think it's a specific goal or objective that we're supposed to achieve, but it, it's, it's a path that we're to walk. It's something that we do today. It's something that gives purpose and meaning to our life. You can't prove that life has purpose. It, it's, it's that thing that comes to us that says, this is right for me and this isn't, because without purpose, there's no way of making that distinction. And what I think is the most important thing that you can do is decide what your purpose is in life. I, I think a, a true farmer today is someone that feels that they were put here on earth to be a farmer, that that's their purpose. They're here to take care of the land. They're here to be a good neighbor. They're here to produce food for people. They feel that that's their purpose. In fact, I tell people that ask me, should I get involved in agriculture? Should I be a farmer? I say, don't even think about it unless you feel a calling. You know, we used to talk about out in the country, the preacher would feel a calling, you know, to go to the pulpit. I, I, I think that's what we should all feel, that we should all feel a calling, not to go to the pulpit, not necessarily be farmers, but we've all got a, a calling. We've got something that we're supposed to do. And we need to open our minds and open our hearts and be led in the direction that we know ethically, socially, and individually that we need to go. I think a life of purpose, a life lived in such a way, no matter what purpose is, we will have made the greatest contribution that we possibly have, could have made toward the good of humanity, regardless of how small our purpose may seem relative to the others, and regardless of how great someone's purpose may seem relative to ours, I don't believe anyone is any more important than anyone else. So what can we do to create a sustainable economy, a sustainable society, a sustainable agriculture? We can begin really close to home and say, what is it that I feel led to do? What do I need to do? What do I need to find the courage to do to help recreate the food system and create new opportunities for myself and for people in my community and for society as a whole? It all boils down to the pursuit of purpose. And the important part is, if we live a life of purpose, I think we will have lived the happiest life that we possibly could have lived, the highest quality of life that we possibly could have lived. So I'll leave you with this thought. Let's just go out and do whatever we feel is really consistent with what we're put here on earth to do. Thank you very much.